out there. And they listen on Facebook. Um, see, there's a guy from India. Good morning. <clears throat> he watches our messages. Cell phone's off. Right? <laughs> we don't have, have a cell phone for a cat like we did last week, right? All right. Now let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you, Lord, for the privilege, Father, uh, of being able to share your word, Father. It's such an honor, and it is a, a humble place to, to be, Lord, knowing the responsibility, Father. And I just pray that you check my heart right now, Lord, as I stand before you, Father. And give me the words to share, especially on this subject of eschatology, Lord. It is a well-known subject, and there is... There is so much uh, out there, Lord God, on this subject, and we've all probably have heard so much, and a lot of it, Lord, is just supposition. It, it, it's not really objective uh, teaching, Lord. A lot of supposition, and we cling to it, hold on to it, as though it's doctrine, and Lord, it really isn't. And we need to have a proper perspective, Father, of, of your truth and your word, Lord, and of those things that kind of are on the sidelines, uh, Father, that pertain to your word. It can be and, and possibly cannot be, Father. And so just give us grace. Give us a balance, as Chuck would say. Don't swing too far to the right or too far to the left. Let's find a balance, Father, that it may encourage us and strengthen us. And Lord, help us to be a, a reflected light of Jesus Christ in our lives, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, well, good morning. good morning. We'll be in Matthew chapter 24. We're still there. Um, I encourage you to have your own Bible study at home. I hope all of you are reading your Bible, reading through it, reading through a devotional book uh, or an app of some sort that keeps track of your daily reading with the Lord. We should all have one. When we come here on Sunday mornings, um, I'm going to share with you what the Lord lays on my heart, okay? I'm not going to share with you what a person on this side asked me to share or a person on that side asked me to share because everyone wants to hear a certain subject or, or a thought or even uh, will direct me as far as how many scriptures I should be teaching from and, and so forth. So I'm going to share with you what God lays on my heart, okay? Amen. So when you are at home and you're studying the Word, that's where you're going to really learn a lot more. So here you're going to get specific uh, uh, teaching, and you need to be ready to hear what the Lord is saying to you from this text this morning. So we're going to go through about 10 verses or so. We're going to be in verses uh, 15 through 28. <clears throat> and we're still in the series of eschatology, and we're calling this morning's message Eschatology 101C. 101C. So as we're doing the series. So, um, and as I have been doing and giving a little introduction on what eschatology is, so that you really understand uh, what that uh, teaching is all about. So eschatology, eschatology is the study of what the Bible says is going to happen in the end times, okay? It takes the Bible and the scriptures and people study it to find out what's happening in the end times. What about the rapture? What about the tribulation? What about the uh, second coming of Christ? What about the millennium age? And that's all called eschatology. Now, eschatology is not a solid theology. And we have to understand that. Theology is the study of God himself throughout the Bible. Eschatology is not solid like theology. It's not a critical or as critical as Christology, the theology on Christ himself. Who is he? Why did he come? Uh, how did he exist? When did he exist? The study of Christ is more critical than eschatology. Or even uh, seratology. Seratology is the study of our salvation. How critical is that in theology? It's very critical. But yet eschatology is not as important. Now that doesn't mean that it's unimportant to our biblical worldview because we should understand eschatology and how it relates to future events like the rapture or the tribulation period or the second coming or even the millennium. There are those who believe that the millennium age is not a literal age. I believe that it is a literal age. Now, 
I hope that you'll have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying and that you open up your Bible and you write down on a piece of paper and so forth so that you have information that you can go back to later because these things are very important for us to understand. There is no solid basis to deny the literal understanding of the millennium age. But we will get to that point when we get to it. This morning we're going to look at three points. The abomination of desolation, and you may have heard that before. What is that? We're going to look at uh, the Antichrist. And there's a subject there in itself, the Antichrist. That's always a word that we all hear, even the kids hear about Antichrist. Because it is a satanic word, and the satanic realm uses it quite a bit. It, it, it's used in the sense uh, to entice our youth to satanic uh, <coughs> teachings and so forth. We don't have the three points up there. And then the third point is the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. And oftentimes we get confused with the rapture and the second coming of Christ. And so those are two different events that we need to understand. So let's go ahead and, and read verses uh, uh, 15 just to start off. <clears throat> because it's a, it's a long, uh, long study this morning on the tribulation period. So therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So when you see the abomination of desolation, and I'll define that in a minute. When you see this abom abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, that is the temple, in the holy of holies there. When you see that, and then he says in parentheses, whoever reads this, understand. So we're given another time word for end time events. When this abomination takes place, it will take place in the holy place, in the temple of God. Do we have a temple in Israel today? No. So we know this is future uh, event that will take place. This phrase comes from the book of Daniel. So you have to go back to the Old Testament and look at the book of Daniel in chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 12. And then Mark 13 also talks about this abomination of desolation. The word you here means the Jewish nation will see this take place during the tribulation period because it needs to take place in the holy place, which is the temple of God. It has to be in the Jewish nation. Now, I want you to understand this before we go on. That a lot of eschatology, the events that are going on, has nothing to do with us in the United States. All the signs, all the things that are to take place, are all going to be in Israel. So when you read about it, it's all happening in Israel. We get to kind of like be in the stands and watch what's happening in Israel. And that's why we're always to be looking at Israel and what's happening over there. So when this abomination of desolation takes place, and this will be during the tribulation period, it will be in Israel, not in the United States. And sometimes we, we take eschatology as American citizens and we try to... Um, understand it from our perspective when you can't do that. You know, we'll, we'll say things like, is Obama the Antichrist? You know, and the United States state has nothing to do with that. Some are saying now, is Trump the Antichrist? You know, and, and they've said this forever, but we have nothing to do with it. It's all going to happen in Israel or in Europe in that area. And that's even supposition to a certain extent. So, Jesus said, Whoever reads, let him understand. So you see Jesus' heart. He wants you to read the Bible, and he wants you to understand. <clears throat> there are so many out there that don't want you to read the Bible because they want you to understand their philosophy, their thought, their beliefs. I want you to read your Bible so that you understand the Bible, so that when I teach the Bible, you can say, he's right on. <laughs> he's teaching from the Word of God. And so we need to have an understanding, parentheses, which is inserted here just like it is with Mark. And it refers to the reader of Daniel. So, so he's putting you back into Daniel and saying, go back and read Daniel chapter 9, 11, and 12 and get a better understanding of what this means, the abomination of desolation. It encourages the reader to think hard about the words of Daniel. It means look more deeply into it because what is said is less than what is meant. 
I hope you will understand these end time events as we are going through this series and that you will have a better understanding of what events are taking place in the future and then it will encourage you to know that God has you right in the palm of his hand and that he loves you very much. So the first point is the abomination of desolation. What is he talking about there? Now first he's speaking to the Jews. Jesus says very clearly when you see the Event spoken of by Daniel the prophet called the abomination of desolation. Run to the wilderness as fast as you can and get out. These things are going to happen. There are two parts to this horrific event. Two parts. One is a historical part and the other is a prophetic part. One happened in the past and one is going to happen in the future still yet. Now, the one in the past, we can't change that. It's already happened. And we have historical evidence of it happening already. So the first part of this has already been fulfilled. We're looking to the future event that will happen. And we're still waiting. Now, by the way, we will not see it. Because it will happen during the tribulation period. We can understand it. We can know what will take place. But we will not see it if you are a a believer in Christ Jesus. If you have given your life totally to Jesus Christ, then you will not go through the tribulation period. And by the way, now that I said that, can I ask you something? If you're here in church today, I hope that you understand that it's important for you to know Jesus Christ personally. That he gave his personal life for you because he loves you so much. That he doesn't want to see you spend eternity in damnation, nor separated from him. And so he has created such a government within the Christian community that that he has established churches throughout the world to reach as many people as he possibly can reach. And so God loves you so much that he gave his son to take your place on the cross. And once you ask Jesus into your heart, he opens up your eyes so that you have understanding to the truth of God. So I hope this morning that you'll ask God into your heart if you have not yet. If you are here for other reasons, and I know there's a lot of reasons to be here, because mom and dad force you to be here. (laughs) My my mom used to force me to go to church when I was little. I had no choice. I used to force my boys to go to church. They had no choice. Or maybe you're here because we give out food. Or maybe you're here because we're just friendly people. (laughs) But we're friendly for a reason. We're friendly because Jesus has come into our hearts. And, and you, don't, you don't see that in the world too much. In the world, you don't see the friendliness that you have here. And, and so we're hoping that you will come to know Jesus Christ personally. So first, the historical one. And, and this is more history. And, and I'm sorry that it comes off that way to you. I know you come to church and you're like, well, I don't want to hear about history. But it's important that we hear history. So that we have a foundation. We understand what we believe in is a historical book. This is not a fairy tale, as some would say, but there's some historical evidence to it. So let me give you that first so that you understand that these things do come to pass, as God said. Daniel 11.31 speaks of the historical aspect of the the abomination of desolation. Now say that three times and you'll get tight tongue too. Abomination of desolation. It's a reference to a, a tragic event in Jewish history. Now, this is how it reads in Daniel 11.31. And arms shall stand on this part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. He's talking about the temple. And shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate there. What is he talking about? Someone will literally take away the sacrifices, and then they will go to the temple, and they will desolate it. Now, following the reign of Alexander the Great, and if you know a little bit about history or maybe seen some movies, you know who Alexander the Great is. He was a great king in the times of the Greek um, empires over in that area. He, his name at this time was Antiochus Epiphany, and he was a ruler of Syria. He was a egomaniac. This guy was crazy. He was a madman who believed he was the embodiment of the Greek god Zeus. 
So he thought he was literally Zeus himself, and he was going to rule the world. And, and makes sense because we have seen that throughout our history. You can go back as far as maybe Hitler, and we know that guy was a maniac. And you can see some of the horrific things he did, and he thought himself to be a god to a certain degree. So there is some sense of demonic a possession here and forces behind the ruling power as there will be for the Antichrist also. When Antiochus realized that the Jews of Israel were not acknowledging him as God, he became enraged and ordered the destruction of Jerusalem. Thus on a single day in 170 BC, 100,000 Jewish males were slaughtered. Imagine that number, 100,000. Now, 100,000 is a lot of numbers. That's a lot of people. And they were all slaughtered within one day by this one man. The women were raped, and the cities were looted. Everything was taken and demolished. Then Antiochus himself entered the temple. Then he butchered a pig on the altar and forced the priest to drink its blood and to eat raw pork. This is what he did. Finally, he smeared the remainder of the blood on the temple walls, it was considered to be the abomination of desolation, for it was abominable to the people there of the Jewish nation. That is the first fulfillment of that prophecy of the abomination of desolation. It literally took place by a Greek ruler who put himself in that temple and says, you will worship me as God. And when the Jews would not, he desecrated the temple. Now, the second aspect, an event that will yet happen, we don't know when it will happen, but it will happen in the last days. A man will come on the scene who will make a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, appearing to be Israel's friend. Now, you know, at least our church should understand this if you've been listening to the teachings here, you know that Israel is hated by all nations. This man will come in and somehow bring peace with Israel from all nations. And so he's going to be looked to by the Israel nation and trusted by them to be a friend, a protector, even a leader. He'll solve all the problems in the Middle East. He'll finally have peace. He will be charismatic, persuasive, impressive, intelligent, and a very skilled orator. And this guy will have everything he needs to deceive as many people as he possibly can and including the uh, demonic uh, world's help. He is called the Antichrist in Scripture. He will capture the attention of the entire world, although he will initially come across as a man of peace. And in the middle of the seven-year peace treaty, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us, he will set up his image in the temple and demand to be worshipped as God also. So the Antiochus Epiphany historical event was a forcing or a foreshadow of what was going to happen in the last event. You'll find that a lot of prophecies, let me help you here for those of you that like to study prophecies, you'll find that a lot of prophecies have two folds. There's always a historical and then there is a future event that will take place. This second abomination will result in the desolation across this planet. As Jesus said, when you see this happen, he said, run. We will find the abomination of desolation in Daniel with some variations of word in chapter 8, 9, 11, and 12, as I said. But most scholars agree that there is a reference to this desecration by Antiochus Epiphany and the future event. Chapter 9, 27 says this, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is the Antichrist. Confirming a covenant with the nation Israel and the world. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offerings. Just like Antiochus Epiphany. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Daniel 12, 11 says, From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be, no, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, Daniel gives us the insight here that that will take place right about the middle of the tribulation period, which is three and a half years, and this will all begin. So when the rapture takes place, 
it will roughly be about three and a half years before he shows onto the screen to show exactly his true colors, that he is here to be worshipped as God. There will be great peace in the very beginning. And this is really what people are looking for. They're looking for peace. We're looking for peace right now in our own nation. People are so divided against one another. And it's all political. It's between the Democrats and the Republicans, between the liberals and the conservatives. And this is happening not just in our nation, but everywhere else. There's so, so much unsettling in our world today, and so much so in Israel. And this man will come on the scene and bring that peace for three and a half years, and people will buy into it. Paul elaborates <clears throat> on the future fulfillment of this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4. That day will come unless the falling away first comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Last week we looked at Isaiah, and we saw that Satan himself wanted to sit on a throne above God's throne. And so the Antichrist will be a possessed man by Satan. Now, as a believer, we're not looking for the abomination of desolation. That's not something that we're going to see. But the people in the last days, they will see it, and that will be during the tribulation period, who will be the Jews. So instead of us looking for the Antichrist and the abominations of desolations, we're told in Titus 13, I'm sorry, 2.13, what we should be looking for. We should be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we should be looking for. We should be looking up and to see when Jesus is coming Amen. back to redeem us. When that horn shouts and the angel, and we know that the trump of God is calling us, and then we will be raptured up into heaven, and then everything will be unfold. So we don't have to fear or worry. We can trust in God. So, verses uh, 16 through 20 in Matthew 24, Jesus warns what should be done when the abomination of desolation appears. And that is, we should, or they should flee there in Israel. Look at verse 16 through 20. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop Go down to take, not go down to take anything out of the house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in the last days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So here he gives us a little details during the tribulation period. When you see this happening, he's saying, flee, Jewish people. You need to leave the place in the area because his wrath is going to come down on you. That is the Antichrist. He will try to destroy them all. And in fact, he will kill quite a few as God's wrath comes upon the people. He says, if you're on the housetop, and usually the housetop was flat in those days, you would do a lot of cooking on the housetop, a lot of socializing on the housetop. You look at the stars all day, do a lot of praying on the housetop. They pretty much lived on the housetop uh, quite a bit. And he's saying that if you're on the housetop, you know, the tendency when something urgent comes up is to go down into the house and take something out of the house and take off. He's saying, don't do that. And we get an idea of that with the fires that were over here, right? They said evacuate, and people were trying to get their stuff to evacuate, and they could only hold so much, and they left. A lot of their stuff burnt down. So that's what Jesus is saying. Don't even go down into the rooms of your home. Just take off and go. If you're out in the fields, again, you're working, you have a tendency of taking your cloak, your clothes off, you lay it on the side, it's hot, you get sweaty, you lay them there. And you're working away. And immediately when this all happens, he says, don't go back for your cloak, just take off. You don't have enough time. It's that serious. You need to move out of there. If you're pregnant, he says, don't try not to be pregnant during that time. Now, this is Israel in that area. Don't be pregnant because you're going to move a lot slower. You need to get out of there as quickly as you can. Um, if it's on the Sabbath... Oh, hope that it's not on the Sabbath, because you're Jewish. And on the Sabbath, you're supposed to stay in the house. Uh, you're not supposed to leave, and so you're going to be forced to leave. And so a lot of you will be killed because of that. If it's winter, you don't want, to, you want it to happen in the winter either, because it's cold. There's snow. There's, there's obstacles. And this has to happen right away. So be very careful. 
be very careful. So he's giving them, giving them warning about these events. Now, 21 through 28 is coming after the abomination of desolation, which is what we call the great tribulation period. Look at verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, <clears throat> such as has not been seen or since the beginning of the world until this time, nor and no, nor ever shall be. This tribulation that begins will be worse than anything we have ever seen, is what he's saying here. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone say to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives still, I'm telling you this beforehand, therefore, if, you, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, you do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the sun or, or will the coming of the Son of Man be. For whatever the carcass is, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will gather together. We'll talk about that in a second. So, Revelation chapter 6 through 19 deal with the tribulation period. So you can take your Bible later on and read through those chapters and get an idea. might be a little confusing. You might want to go ahead and, and see about getting our messages on Revelation to have a better understanding of that. It says, for, Jesus said, for then shall be great tribulation. Great tribulation. In, in Revelation 7, 14, the literal translation is the tribulation, the great one. Placing the article before both the noun and the adjective gives it emphasis. This tribulation will be worse than anything you have ever seen, is what Jesus is saying. It's not like the tribulations you've seen in the world. You cannot compare it to the year AD 70 that took place and how many Jews were killed, or by the Maccabeans. Even what Antiochus Epiphany did, by killing 100,000 Jews and raping women and taking everything, you can't even compare it to that. Mm. That's how bad this is going to be compared to all the tribulations that have happened ever before. The genocide is going to be horrific. You can't even understand how bad it's going to be. And I say that to those who will be here you don't want to be here. You want to make sure your life is right before the Lord. He says, unless those days were shortened. Uh, in the Greek, it's to dock, to cut off, or even to leave a stump as a limb. Shortened is cutting it off completely that it's done and it's over with. No flesh will be saved, he said. So God has to intervene and stop it. Otherwise, everybody will be destroyed. But for the elect's sake. Well, who's the elect's sake? We know that, Israel. It's not talking about the church. It's talking about Israel. God is going to stop it for them. <clears throat> now, we can only imagine it and surmise when this happens, the people that are living here in the United States. We can only guess what's going to happen. We, we really don't know. If, if people are behind, left behind, they're going to live here in the United States, and they'll be living under whatever government regime is here as the things are taking place in Israel. There may be a one world government at that time. I would, I would guess that, that uh, uh, Trump is no longer in office because he's not for one world government, so he will either be killed or, or they've impeached him. But there will be world peace taking place and we will probably continue, Americans will probably continue to live their life in this great peace. And they will be seeing what's going on over there. Some suggest, again, supposition, and, uh, we get involved in some sort of nuclear war. Maybe Iran or maybe even North Korea has destroyed us to a certain degree. Crippled us, crippled our armies that we can't do anything. We become maybe a third world country of some sort. But we're not involved in what's taking place in Israel. For their sake, God will cut it short because of his great love for them. Now we come to verse 23 to 25. What will be the sign of his coming? He says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, he says, don't believe it. Now, then, the word then there does not necessarily do, uh, denote a immediately after. In the Greek, it's suggesting that the time is not 
specific. It could be in a year, it could be in a thousand years. And we know that it's thousands of years because it hasn't happened yet here. So in the times of troubled people, we have a tendency to look for someone to help us. And so when we need someone to help us, we look for spiritual leaders or good leaders to help us out of our situations. And that will be the case in the end times. That will be when false spiritual leaders will come on the scene and they will begin to say that I am the Messiah. I am the chosen one. Come follow me. They did this back in 1921. They said that um, Jesus was coming to Brooklyn. That he would reveal, reveal himself to the watchtower. And they'll even, if you talk to some Jehovah Witnesses, they'll say that he's actually among us, walking with us here on this earth. But I don't see that anywhere. Or when others said he was coming in 1800s, or they revealed themselves as being the likeness of Joseph Smith, and he was the Antichrist. So many have said this in the past. Uh, many have called Nixon Antichrist. I remember Bush Antichrist, and people come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. They don't understand biblical eschatology. So this second point, the Antichrist. In Revelation 13, talks about the false messiah and the false prophet who will lead the world to worship the false messiah. And we are told in Revelation that they will come with great signs and great wonders. So you have a false messiah and a false prophet and a world leader that will be leading in this world. And they will all want you to worship the Antichrist. And they will have evidence of signs and wonders. They will literally do miracles. They will do great events and people will believe them. And this is, I believe, why we shouldn't be looking for signs and wonders. We shouldn't put the emphasis on signs and wonders. We should be putting the emphasis on the word Amen. of God and what it says and believe what it says. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says, as Paul was talking about this man of sin, he talks how he will deceive the world with these signs and wonders and miracles that he will perform. In fact, if it was possible, even the elect would be deceived. That is the Jewish people. Now, they may have buy it in the beginning, but then when he stands into the temple and claims to be God and demands worship, then they will realize, we need to get out of here. And that was when they'll flee to Petra, which is an area there in Israel that will protect them. <clears throat> one day, the Antichrist will be revealed, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 tells us, and we will recognize him. This is what it says. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And it is likely that most people who are alive during this time will see the identity of who he is. We don't know who he is today. Some have suggested that he is here today, and he is here every year until the Lord returns. And they say that because they believe that Satan enters him, and then he becomes the antichrist of that generation. So let me give you an example of that. So he could be a world leader who is well-known, who is very charismatic, and it's not going to be from the United States, but probably in Europe and that area, and that's all supposition too. But he could be around, he's well-liked, but he does not fit the role of antichrist until Satan enters him. And then, if that is the generation that will begin the tribulation period, he will then begin to play that role as antichrist. So they suggest that antichrist is always around, always around. It's just that if it's the time, then he will get possessed, and that's when he becomes the fulfillment of Scripture. And again, as I said, many have called themselves antichrist. But we should put the speculations behind us and focus on what the Bible actually says about the antichrist. In Revelation 13, 5 through 8, it declares this, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, 
and to exercise his authority for 42 months, three and a half years. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints, that is the saints during the tribulation period, and he conquers them. And then he was given authority over the tribes, the people, the language, the nations. And so he has total power over the world system. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So you get a picture of this man ruling everyone, and who was not written in the book of life, he rules over them completely. And they are totally under his submission. They're slaves to him, except for the Jewish nations and the people who have accepted Jesus Christ during that time. Now verses 27 and 28 are probably the hardest verses of the Bible, especially in Matthew here, because these are hard to interpret. We really don't know what these verses are speaking about. Is it speaking about the tribulation period, or is it speaking about the second coming of Christ? Most suggest that it's speaking about the second coming of Christ. Because it says, for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, is that saying that's when he comes? Or is it saying that those things will be happening and his coming is, is soon? Then it says, for whatever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Carcasses, we know are dead bodies. Eagles, or a better translation would be vultures. Vultures eat dead bodies. And so there seems to be some sort of uh, a horrific, you know, catastrophe of human casualties. And the birds are just flying and eating and consuming everything in sight. The reference of the east and west suggests Christ's final judgment upon the earth. So it could be the end of the tribulation period, and then we're going to see his second coming to destroy the Antichrist and the world. But I personally, I have no idea. If you have some idea, then praise God. He's given you some insight that I don't have. Um, again, as believers, we don't have to worry about what will happen, but it's nice to, to know that we won't, uh, we won't be there at that time. So the second coming, what is that about? The second coming of Christ. <clears throat> we know the first coming of Christ was as a suffering servant. He came to suffer on the cross and pay for our sins by his death on that cross so that we could have eternal life. His second coming will be as a conquering king. So we want to receive Christ today and not then. In his first coming, Jesus will arrive, or he did arise as the most humble servant of all humanity. In his second coming, Jesus will arrive as a ruler commanding his army from heaven. The second coming is when Jesus will return to earth in fulfillment of his promises and to fulfill the prophecies made concerning his judgments and wrath being poured on the earth. Jesus himself promises that at that time the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all nations of the earth will mourn. It is a horrific time. I wish I could express that more to those of you who have not received Jesus Christ into your hearts. And I know that the answer is, well, you have no evidence to this book being true. Well, on the contrary, there is plenty of evidence for its authority and power. Historically, prophetically, as textual criticism con is concerned, prophecy, the fact is you refuse to accept it because you enjoy your life. And I say enjoy it. Enjoy it because when it happens, it will be too late. And I hope that we will wake up. We will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. Matthew 24, 30 will say, and next week we'll get into that second coming. <clears throat> Revelation 19, 11 through 12 proclaims about the second coming of Christ. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. 
He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. Those who witness Christ's ascension into heaven after his death and resurrection heard the angels declare this. This is in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Disciples are ready to go to the upper room. And they heard this said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that's what was spoken of in Revelation 19. The sky will open up and he will return with his army. The second coming is a literal return of Jesus Christ to the earth as king in power and glory to rule for a thousand years, Revelation 20. A literal return. The skies will open and Jesus will come in. That means that Jesus is alive. That after his death, he resurrected from the dead and he ascended before the apostles into heaven. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father at this moment, making intercession for us whom he loves. But he's waiting for the Father to give him the okay to come back and judge the world. And when the Father gives him that okay, the heavens will open up and Jesus will then descend upon the earth and battle against the Antichrist and the nations of this world. And that's where we get into the battle of Armageddon, which there's controversy over that. When exactly does that happen? And I hope that I'll have enough information to give you an idea of those things. So saying all of this... <clears throat> Saying all this, I want to say this to close. Do you believe in God? Yes. Does believing in God get you into heaven? No. James makes it clear the demons believe in God. In fact, they even seen God because they're fallen angels. They were created by God and they were in heaven with God. And they saw God. So they definitely recognize and acknowledge that he exists because they've seen him. They, they have the empirical evidence. They saw it all. And yet, they fear and they tremble. Why do they fear and tremble? Because they will be judged. Because they have rebelled within their hearts against God, along with Lucifer. So just believing and acknowledging God will not get you into heaven. You have to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You have to believe in him. You've got to get into that boat with him. You have to say, Lord, I'm surrendering my life for you. Now I want to live for you. I'm making the choice to have faith that has fruit of works of righteousness. That is salvation. If you have not come to a personal relationship with Jesus, then you have no relationship at all with God. It has to be a personal relationship with him. You know what personal relationship is. If you're married, if you have a friend or a daughter or a granddaughter or a grandson or a child, you know what personal relationship is. It's a personal relationship with an individual. And you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I woke up this morning about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning and immediately I just started praying, talking to God in my relationship, just asking him some questions. And it was interesting because all of a sudden he began to speak to me. Not in a voice, but he's just in my head, you know. And I'm like, God, you know, it's amazing how you're eternal. And I'm, just, I'm just telling him this and, you know, as I'm talking to him. You're eternal. And then it dawned on me. We've only been around for 7,000 years. You're eternal 7,000 years. I'm like, God, what did you do <laughs> while we weren't here? I mean, you've always existed. What were you doing? Of course, we have no idea what he was doing. He was existing. How did you occupy your time? You know, I mean, well, you created angels, okay. They were before us, so, but we don't know how long they were in existence. And then I'm thinking, wow, 7,000 years. You probably couldn't get a, a, a uh, telescope or whatever that is, a microscope, and find a cell to, to, to you know, compare it to eternity. We're like a half a cell, or maybe we're like a billionth of a half of a cell compared to eternity. And I thought, well, that's impersonal. And he said, is it? I created you guys, and I sent my son to die on the cross for you. I'm like, oh, no, that is personal, and that's love. Because from that point on, when he created Adam and Eve, guess what? We now get to live eternally with him. 
So now he will never be alone again. Not that he's lonely, and not that he needed us, but he will never be alone again. We will be with him in eternity forever. As long as now we have just went from a billionth of a cell to now that timeline from that point on, we're, we're there for eternity. That is amazing. That's a personal relationship as you're communing with God. He begins to reveal himself to you. And he wants to do that on a daily basis with us. But you have to have a personal relationship with him. And the Bible is clear. It's clear that you have to believe, you have to trust, you have to cling to him completely. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Father, this is probably the, the most important part of even this whole message, Lord, is having a personal relationship with Jesus, knowing that we are his children and we're saved and we will spend eternity with him. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we just want to make sure that everyone here this morning is saved. Everyone has given their life to Jesus completely over to him. And that means they have to stop living that old life. That means they have to stop living in the world. They have to stop viewing that garbage. They have to stop uh, committing that sin. They have to submit themselves to you, Lord, completely. They have to become those new creatures in Christ Jesus. It has to be from their own will. And I pray, Lord, this morning that they begin to live for you. If there's anyone here that's even doubting that, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you sure you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If not, just raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you. Just raise your hand. Just put it up and then put it down. You want to make sure that you have that personal relationship with him. If you're sinning and walking in sin and living in sin, you don't. Let me make that clear. If you're smoking marijuana without a prescription and you're doing it illegally, you're in sin and you're living that way. That's not having a relationship with Jesus. Get into a relationship with him where he is ruling your life. And if he's not ruling your life, raise your hand right now and ask him to rule your life. Thank you. Father, you saw the hands go up. And so we're just going to trust in you. And Lord, all of us, we all believe, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. And that we have eternal life because we believe in him. And so those that raise their hands, Lord, they want to live for you, Lord. And so right now, Lord, let us all just agree together as we repeat these words. Lord Jesus, you are our God. You are our king. Yes, Lord. We have submitted our lives to you completely. From this point forward, Lord, we want to know you more intimately. We want to read your word, Lord. We want to be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We want to feel the power of God in our lives. Lord, we want to be corrected by you, Lord, when we start walking in a different direction. We want to know right from wrong, Lord. And we want to know it and hear it through your voice, Lord. So that we may know that we're yours. And you love us. And we pray this, Lord, with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Let's stand for the song.